We'll come to order. Uh, welcome everyone to the Keeping the Lights On Strategies for Grid Resiliency and Reliability hearing. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess of the committee at any time. As a reminder, members participating in a hearing remotely should be visible on camera throughout the hearing. As with in-person meetings, members are responsible for controlling their own microphones. Members can be muted by staff only to uh, avoid inadvertent background noise. And as a reminder, statements, documents, or motions must be submitted to the electronic repository at sccc.repository at mail.house.gov. Finally, members or witnesses experiencing any technical problems should inform the committee staff immediately. And I want to thank you all for joining our remote hearing of the Select Committee on the Climate Crisis. Today, we will review how the bipartisan infrastructure laws, policies, and investments will help improve grid resilience and consider what additional climate and clean energy investments are needed to help strengthen America's electrical grid. I'll now recognize myself for five minutes for an opening statement. As the, as the climate crisis continues to threaten our communities, we cannot remain stuck in the past. The key to solving the climate crisis is electrifying our economy now. And the key to electrifying our economy is a strong and reliable grid with all of the incredible innovations that were not even envisioned 20 years ago. Strengthening the grid today increases the chances that we can keep the lights on tomorrow after extreme weather hits. A strong grid also will help us drive down the cost of disasters, avoid disruptions, and allow businesses to bounce back faster. And it can reduce the cost of energy year round as more Americans power their homes and cars with affordable clean energy made in the USA. Strengthening the grid is also about saving lives. Just last summer, at least one in three Americans experienced a climate-fueled disaster. And in many cases, the consequences were deadly. We all remember the destructive winter storm only one year ago that knocked out electricity in much of Texas and in other areas across the Southeast, leaving millions without power. Nearly 250 people died in the aftermath, and too many families were left without drinking water, without food or shelter, and stuck with astronomical energy bills. And it's not just winter storms. The climate crisis is making wildfires, hurricanes, and heat waves more frequent. In 2018, in Cal California experienced the costliest and most destructive wildfire in its history. The campfire it destroyed more than 18,000 buildings and killed 85 people. It was a devastating reminder of how aging transmission equipment coupled with climate fueled drought exposed communities to unexpected risks. And it was a devastating example of how climate change is expanding the number of harmful scenarios we need to prepare for, making it more challenging to safeguard the places we call home. And that's why today we're focusing on how we strengthen the grid and lower costs for the American people. I'm proud that President Biden's bipartisan infrastructure law made historic investments on this front, including $5 billion for grid hardening, another $5 billion to spur technologies that will improve grid reliability and resilience. The infrastructure law also included $2.5 billion to help build new transmission lines as well as $3 million devoted to enhancing grid flexibility. And it made investments to help uh, address the growing threat of wildfires, including $5 billion to, to bury power lines and build microgrids and more than $3 billion for hazardous fuel reduction, controlled burning and community defense. The innovative advances in uh, grid enhancing technologies are remarkable and we must deploy them at a wide scale to benefit all Americans and help them save on their electric bills. All of these investments provide a great foundation to strengthen our grid, but we cannot stop there. We need additional strategies to keep the climate crisis from getting worse and to unleash an economy powered by our own abundant 
and affordable renewable energy. That includes enacting new tax credits for transmission and storage. It includes expanding tax credits for clean energy and electric vehicles. And it means investing in the greenhouse gas reduction fund, which will help us deploy resilient distributed energy equitably uh, to communities across America. Those are the things the House sent to the Senate in our Build Back Better Act. And we look forward to the Senate getting these critical investments across the finish line. Uh, before I introduce our witnesses, I also wanna set the record straight. In the United States of America, we do not need to choose between energy that's affordable, reliable, or clean. It's not an either or situation. We can have all three. We don't need to pick between lower costs or reliable electric grid or clean air for our kids. Clean energy gives us the chance to have it all. That's why the Biden administration and Democrats in Congress are taking steps to meet these challenges head on. That includes work to develop a national strategy on critical minerals and recycling, which will help us secure the components that we need to to expand clean energy nationwide. And it means doubling down on innovative tools, whether it's harnessing the advances in artificial intelligence or expanding the use of buildings to grid uh, and vehicles to grid technologies. That's what's great about innovation in America and our can-do spirit. Our aging electric grid needs major upgrades and expansion. And it's time to integrate the lower cost clean technologies into the power system to invest in adaptation and resilience and to solve the, the climate crisis. With that, I'm happy to recognize the ranking member, Mr. Graves, you're recognized for five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> thank you. And I wanna thank the witnesses for joining us today. Um, Madam Chair, we, we certainly share the objective and I think I speak for all members of the committee that we share the objective of moving in a direction of of uh, improved access to energy, improved affordability to energy, and lower emissions uh, from energy. I think uh, we also agree that, uh, that that our energy needs to be sourced or supplied uh, within the United States. We've had witnesses come and testify before this committee, and we have read uh, expert reports that have found by some measure that we're going to have to triple, we're going to have to triple uh, investment in our electrical grid uh, to meet growing demand. And it's not just about investment in transmission, investment about in the grid, it's investment in generation capacity as well. Um, unfortunately, what we've seen over the last several months is we've seen energy policies that have not resulted in those outcomes. As a matter of fact, we've seen energy prices, depending on the type of energy in the area, increasing anywhere from 24 to 54 percent. We've seen one in every five Americans say they can't even afford to pay their energy bill in full each month. Uh, this is forcing more Americans into energy poverty. Uh, we've seen one of the highest rates of emissions increases last year uh, than we've seen in recent history. And, and so we're not achieving these objectives of, of energy affordability, energy access, or lower emissions. And I think it's important that we look, for example, at uh, my good friend, Mr. Huffman State of, uh, of California and others uh, as examples of where we can extract lessons learned. Um, we've seen examples where the state of California is uh, choosing to shut down nuclear power plants and then the next day sending a letter asking for waivers on clean air act emissions so they can emit more but, um, because they're gonna go from a, a carbon free uh, generation capacity into using coal and natural gas. Um, we've seen a state with the least reliable grid in America and this is the state that's leaning uh, farthest forward in, in regard to uh, trying to implement a climate strategy and forcing markets in directions of renewable energy where markets clearly aren't capable of sustaining them. Uh, we see a state that is the most dependent state on importing energy, including, um, as we recently discussed uh, last week, uh, the state that is res responsible for 50% of uh, the energy coming out of the Amazon um, rainforest in, in Ecuador. I mean, these are things that that simply don't make sense. Maybe we can go over to the Northeast. Sorry, Mr. Huffman, I'm going to pivot now. Um, go over to the <laughs> Northeast. I know you're going to give me back. Uh, uh, but, but go over to the Northeast where we have seen repeatedly where uh, in New England, they've had to bring in uh, liquefied natural gas from Russia to meet the, the energy demands. Um, it, it, it's amazing. There was a recent uh, EIA report 
that says that although oil fired generators are infrequently used in New England, they play an important role in meeting electricity demand in the region during times of high demand and limited supply of alternative fuel sources such as natural gas. It goes on to say that cold weather and constraints on natural gas pipelines to, to New England can sometimes limit the availability of natural gas delivered to power plants during winter months. These constraints can increase the price of natural gas in the region. Madam Chair, if we simply applied the electricity rates in my home state of Louisiana uh, to the state State of California, you would see uh, a, a reduction in rates of almost 51%, 51%. I'm sure that the, the citizens of California would welcome that type of reduction. We can't sit here and, and have rational discussions or move in a direction of rational policy where we are saying the same thing energy access improvements, energy affordability improvements, lower emissions, whenever the, the, the facts that are being, or, the, or the, the, the words that are being thrown out there don't match the facts. The reality is California has had some of the worst emissions growth in America. We need to be learning from California, learning from New England, and even learning from the UK where they went and leaned too hard on wind energy, had a year without much wind and saw uh, spikes in, in natural gas prices in, in that country that, that is causing the lack of affordability and the lack of access. Madam Chair, the Biden administration has said energy uh, demand is gonna increase 50% between now and 2050. And depending on developing or non-developing undeveloping countries, non-developing countries, you're gonna see an increase in natural gas demand alone anywhere from 31 to 80% increase. We need to have a strategy in the United States to meet these demands, to ensure that our citizens aren't forced into energy poverty as a result of these policies that lack evidence, that are actually uh, ignoring evidence to the contrary. Um, and, and a perfect example is the Biden administration choosing to shut down the Twin Metals mine that is projected to serve approximately 70% of the rare earth and critical mineral needs in the United States. These, they just, they don't match reality. So Madam Chair, I look forward to, to, to hearing from some of our witnesses today. I look forward to uh, being able to ask questions, but making sure that we're heading down a path that's actually logical and based on the evidence that's been presented to us. Yield back. And without objection, members who wish to enter an opening statement into the record, have, everyone has five business days to do so. Uh, now I'd like to welcome our witnesses. We'll hear from leading industry experts regarding how the bipartisan infrastructure law and additional clean energy investments can help us increase the resilience of our nation's grid, uh, the whole grid infrastructure, as especially as we move towards the clean energy economy. Uh, first, I'll recognize Congresswoman Brownlee to introduce Nancy Sutley. Thank you, Madam Chair, for this honor. I appreciate it very much. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce Ms. Nancy Sutley, who currently serves as the Senior Assistant uh, General Manager of External and Regulatory Affairs and the Chief Sustainability Officer for the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power. And her role, Ms. Sutley oversees conservation, regulatory, and sustainability efforts for the largest municipal utility in the United States serving 4 million residents. Not a better witness for us uh, today. I've known Ms. Sutley for many years and our work together dates back to my time in the California State Assembly when Ms. Sutley served as a board member for the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California and as deputy mayor of the city of Los Angeles for energy and environment. Our work together continued when Ms. Sutley was appointed to lead President Obama's uh, Council on Environmental Quality. Under her leadership, CEQ played a central role in shepherding the Obama administration's signature environmental projects, and she was one of the chief architects of President Obama's Climate Action Plan. Ms. Sutley has dedicated her career to public service and environmental protection and has long been recognized for her work as a climate leader as she has advocated for strong climate policies aimed at improving conservation, environmental regulation, decarbonization goals of the energy sector, and so much more. Ms. Sutley is a forward-thinking leader in government and has extensive experience bringing together 
stakeholders from all sectors to shift to a more sustainable future. Uh, thank you, Nancy, for being here today to speak about your work. I look forward to hearing from you and I yield back, Madam Chair. Thank you, Rep. Brownlee, and welcome, Ms. Sutley. Next, uh, Dr. Karen Whalen is the Chief Executive Officer of GridWise Alliance. She is an expert in energy and environmental policy and leads a diverse group of stakeholders supporting grid modernization. During the Obama administration, Dr. Whalen oversaw the development of strategies for working with state and local governments at the Department of Energy. Dr. Whalen also uh, previously served as Senior Advisor for Domestic Energy Policy to the Deputy Secretary of Energy. Mr. Mark Mills uh, is the Senior Fellow at the Manhattan Institute, Faculty Fellow at the McCormick School of Engineering and Applied Science, and Co-Director at the Institute of Manufacturing Science and Innovation at Northwestern University. He's a former experimental physicist and engineer and provided science and technology policy counsel to pri private sector firms, the Department of Energy and the US Research Laboratories. Mr. Mills previously served in the White House Science Office under President Reagan. And Ms. Catherine Hamilton is the chair of 38 North Solutions and chair of the Global Future Council on Clean Electri Electrification at the World Economic Forum. She provides public policy and business development services to clean energy companies and organizations. Ms. Hamilton is an international clean energy policy expert and led several councils of the World Economic Forum. She previously led buildings research at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and designed grids for Virginia Power. Uh, without objection, the witnesses' written statements will be made part of the record. Uh, with that, Ms. Sutley, you are now recognized. You're first up to give a five-minute presentation of your testimony. Welcome. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Representative Brownlee, for that kind introduction and for all that you do for the people of California and the United States. Uh, Chair Castor and Ranking Member Graves and members of the committee, I'm very honored to be here with you today. Um, as you've heard, uh, Los Angeles Department of Water and Power is the na nation's largest municipally owned utility. Uh, we serve the 4 million residents of Los Angeles, its uh, businesses and visitors, including uh, some of those who were in town for some big football game over the weekend. Um, for more than 100 years, LADWP has provided the city of Los Angeles with reliable water and power service in a cost-effective and environmentally responsible manner. LADWP's power system is vertically integrated with our own transmission and distribution system and a diverse mix of energy generation resources. Today's hearing topic is, is very important. A reliable and resilient electric grid is essential for a strong and vibrant Los Angeles. And we have a strong track record and invest significantly in our power infrastructure. However, the impacts of climate change can affect the reliability of our grid. Los Angeles lives with the ever-present threat of longer wildfire seasons, more extreme heat, and prolonged droughts. The men and women of LADWP work every day to ensure our grid is re reliable, resilient, and affordable. And even during a heat wave, we have enough electrical capacity to meet the highest demands, but sustained high temperatures strain electrical cables and distributing stations. And when it doesn't cool down at night during a heat wave, high nighttime temperatures further tax equipment. Our wildfire mitigation efforts include system hardening, vegetation management, operation protocols, and, and maintenance programs. But wildfires can potentially put power lines out of service for days or weeks. To support Los Angeles' decarbonization goals, LADWP is transforming its electric grid to 100% clean energy. And over the decades, we've expanded renewable energy, replaced coal with clean energy, upgraded our transmission, invested in energy storage, rooftop solar, energy efficiency measures, and supported electrification. And as a result, we've cut our greenhouse gas emissions by more than half from our 1990 levels. And we've kept our power rates 
competitive. They're generally lower than other cities in California. To understand the pathways to 100% clean energy for LADWP, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory completed its LA100 study in March of 2021. And this study showed multiple pathways to achieve 100% renewable energy grid while prioritizing reliability, equity, and affordable rates. And in fact, it found that it was feasible to get there by 2035. The 2035 carbon-free scenario increases renewable energy, energy storage, and anticipates more rooftop solar, energy efficiency, and demand management. Investments in transmission and distribution infrastructure and firm generation using a renew renewable fuel such as green hydrogen. We're making investments in clean energy. Some recent examples, the Red Cloud Wind Project in New Mexico began commercial operation in December of 2021. Uh, we're launching a new program to assist apartment dwellers to save energy and money. And the IPP Renewed Project will replace coal with green hydrogen, first as a mix with natural gas, and then 100% green hydrogen. So there are a number of things that the federal government can do to help us meet these goals. Federal funding can leverage our investments and can accelerate technology development and deployment of low or zero carbon energy resources. An example, we're part of a cooperative called HIDEAL, which is trying to reduce the cost of green hydrogen. Uh, money in the bipartisan infrastructure law around hydrogen and the hydrogen hubs at DOE can really help accelerate that uh, goal. The federal government can support the expansion of the nation's transmission grid. We see a need for transmission investment, including increasing local transmission capacity. Federal investment in electric vehicle charging infrastructure will help meet the needs of the growing electric vehicle mar market. But we also know from the LA100 study that high levels of electrification can help mitigate rate impacts. Federal policies and investments to reduce wildfire risk can help us remain reliable and resilient. Finally, tax credits have helped to spur the clean energy industry. Policies could allow tax exempt utilities like LADWP to benefit directly from those renewable and clean energy tax incentives. Thank you for inviting me today to share these thoughts and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Sutley. Next, uh, Dr. Whalen, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Castor, Ranking Member Graves, and members of the committee. Thank you for convening this important discussion on the resilience and reliability of the nation's electric grid. My name is Karen Wayland. I'm the CEO of Gridwise Alliance. Um, our members are industry stakeholders focused on accelerating innovation to deliver a secure, reliable, resilient, and affordable grid and support decarbonization of the U.S. economy. Gridwise members include utilities of all sizes and business models, regional transmission operators, grid equipment manufacturers and tech companies, research institutes, and others. For our members, especially our utilities, the resilience, reliability, and affordability of electricity is of paramount importance, and all are committed to a low carbon power supply. Let me start by saying that every utility in every state faces resilience challenges. From severe storms to drought, earthquakes, sea level rise, and geomagnetic pulses, each requiring different risk management practices. And cyber and physical attacks are a constant, increasing, and evolving threat to the electricity system. Gridwise member Hitachi Energy notes that our grid is evolving to be more interconnected and operating closer to its limits, making the ability to ride through disruptive events like extreme weather more important in focusing just on avoiding disruption entirely. They note, power systems should be able to fall back on locally available sources in case the transmission grid is not available. Even if local generation capacity is insufficient to cover local load completely, supplying critical infrastructures such as water supply, hospitals, or telecommunication networks would be essential at the minimum. Gridwise convened members representing over 40% of the US electric customers to discuss grid resilience a few years ago in the face of large scale disruptive events. Our report includes lessons from our members real world experience. First, grid modernization technologies can prevent outages and decrease projected impacts. Second, distributed generation technologies can enhance the resilience of the grid. Third, Information and communications technology infrastructures should be more resilient, reliable, and secure. And then fourth, 
emergency response planning processes can result in better deployment and coordination of human and grid equipment resources. I'd like to give you some examples of GridWise members' work to enhance grid resilience. First, let's start off with uh, Chair Castor, um, a utility in her state, FPL, Florida Power and Light. Following devastating hurricanes in 2004 and 2005, FPL inv invested significantly in grid hardening and preparedness and has since become a leader in the industry on resilience. The 2017 Hurricane Irma was a stronger storm than Wilma in 2005, but as a result of their investments, average customer outages were 60% less and days to full power restoration for all customers went from 18 days to 10 days. The faster restoration had broad societal and economic benefits but the investments in resilience also had day-to-day -day reliability benefits. Portland General Electric will mitigate wildfires, severe storm events, and growing load by adding weather stations and wildfire cameras, undergrounding high voltage lines, adding smart protective relays, storage, and rebuilding substations, upgrading transmission lines, and creating resilient zones that will serve residents during potential outages during winter storms and wildfire season when power shutoff may be necessary to prevent a catastrophic wildfire event. PGE's distribution automation investments alone have prevented millions of customer outage minutes since 2018. The February 2021 freeze led Bandera Electric Cooperative in Texas to focus on behind the meter residential resources like solar storage, HVAC systems, pools, and other distributed energy resources as critical to grid resilience. BEC's new platform, ApolloWare, now collects real-time data to provide visibility at the grid, at the grid edge. For example, during the freeze event, home power use was 500% higher and HVAC demand 620% higher than normal. But energy use varied by a factor of 21 times, meaning that some homes were more cold sensitive and used more energy relative to other homes. ApolloWare also provided insights into how appliances behind the meter were using electricity and allowed BEC to notify customers to stop charging storage units to save energy. In a filing to the Public Utility Commission of Texas, BEC's CEO concluded that having behind the meter visibility would help ERCOT with better grid planning and more importantly, better understanding of how to minimize blackouts through the development of an intelligent demand response program based on fleet-wide monitoring control of HVAC water heaters, pool pump devices, and others. Further, we have the technology to operate an intelligent grid down to the appliance level, but we need energy efficiency programs and demand response programs tied to market pricing to keep the loss of power voluntary. If these programs had been in place last February, the CEO believes that voluntary load reductions would have been adequate to keep the grid from rolling blackouts on a statewide basis. The $11 billion in the bipartisan infrastructure law um, for resilience funding will allow utilities around the country to accelerate their resilience projects. Gridwise Alliance thanks the committee for the opportunity to provide insights on the resilience of the nation's electricity system. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, ne next, Mr. Mills, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Castor and Ranking Member Graves for the opportunity to testify. As uh, you uh, accurately pointed out in your inter introductory remarks, uh, and ev everyone knows electricity infrastructures are of course critical to modern societies and citizens and businesses expect and even take for granted that our grids will operate reliably and affordably. So it's relevant to note some differences between America's grids today compared to a couple of decades ago. Overall, grid reliability has actually been degrading, even as the average consumer electricity costs have risen. The latter is up about, on average, 50% since the year 2000. And of course, today, one big difference is that a significant share, almost 12% of the nation's electricity, is now supplied by solar and wind. The fact is, wind and solar technologies are far cheaper and more useful than any time in history, and thus have a substantial role in the nation's energy mix, but the critical issue now is how much non-dispatchable wind and solar capacity can be added without further degrading grid reliability because those two sources dominate current plans and proposals to expand energy supplies. Grid reliability so far has been achieved by using power plants that can be dispatched when needed for the time needed to meet expected peaks and unexpected peaks and for when outages occur from machine failures or from weather. Going forward, there are three key realities relevant to grid reliability that emerge, I'd like to point out, from the physics of energy systems that depend on batteries, the sun, and wind. First, obviously, sunlight and wind vary, and quite radically, and are impossible to dispatch at will. 
the central issue isn't the daily or hourly variability that people talk about, but seasonal variabilities. While the amount of sunlight or wind can be 50% less in off seasons, far more challenging are the days along droughts or so-called droughts, if you like, of wind, when there's no wind or no sun at all. Such episodes are surprisingly common, even if inherently unpredictable in terms of precisely when they occur, but they do occur. The adage that it's always sunny or windy somewhere in the country is simply not true over decade time periods. One solution to this reality would be to copy the German model, which has built essentially two grids, one using solar and wind, the other keeping conventional generation. That's a big reason German households, by the way, pay about 300% more for electricity than in America. But as Europe discovered recently, when the inevitable wind droughts happen, the dual grid option exposes consumers to radical energy price spikes. In fact, the dual grid model creates those price spikes. The other option, of course, is to use grid scale batteries. These require uh, extra generating capacity, again, roughly double, to both meet peak demand when the sun and wind are available and have surplus to simultaneously store in the batteries. Which brings us to the second physics reality. Storing electricity is extremely difficult at grid scales. Some analysts uh, propose that 12 hours of national backup would enable a nearly all solar wind grid to keep America's lights on 99.97% of the time. However, that statistically and meteorologically means that about a half day of no power anywhere in the country every few years or so. And the 12 hours of batteries would cost about a trillion dollars to build. As for claims that batteries will get cheaper, last year the historical trend in battery price declines saw a dramatic slowdown, down just 6%, and prices are now forecast to rise this year. The reason is that mineral commodities make up 60 to 70 percent of the cost to build batteries. And going forward, commodity inflation is likely to continue, which brings me to my third and last point anchored in the physics of energy. Batteries are very materials intensive ways to store large amounts of energy. About 50 tons of batteries are needed to hold the amount of energy contained of one ton of oil. And then roughly 25,000 tons of materials have to be mined and processed to obtain the minerals needed to fabricate those 50 tons of batteries. The IEA, among others, has studied the implications of this, and they've pointed out that these energy transition goals based on batteries, wind and solar will require 400 to 4,000% increase in the mining of a range of critical minerals, far more than all the global mines now produce or any plans for expansion. Finally, it bears noting that China is the single largest source, by most accounts, nearly half of all the critical materials for making batteries, as well as solar mod modules, by the way. The United States is a minor player. And aside from the geopolitical and trade considerations, it would require a World War II level of construction effort to build the quantities of wind, solar, and battery systems needed to replace America's conventional power plants by, say, 2040. The latter couldn't happen unless we cleared away regulatory delays, something else that's not now being proposed anywhere. Thank you. Madam Chair, you're muted. Okay, uh, Ms. Hamilton, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, good afternoon. Thank you to Chair Castor, Ranking Member Graves, and the entire Select Committee for inviting me to testify. I will explore what makes our grid and communities more resilient and how resilience has been partially incentivized in the Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, but will be even further enhanced by final passage of the Build Back Better Act. First, to briefly differentiate between reliability and resilience, since they're often used interchangeably, reliability is the characteristic of being there all the time, 24-7, 365 days a year. Resilience is the ability to recover quickly from interruption. Our electric grid has been designed for reliability, power plants, transmission lines, distribution systems that are available and operating all the time. And yet that system is becoming less reliable. The drop in reliability can be tracked to weather-related climate events, wildfires, ice storms, unprecedented flooding, extreme heat and cold that have been increasing in frequency and level of damage. Resilience and reliability are now linked inextricably and must be considered together. In response to that need, utilities have been investing billions of dollars on equipment, technology, updated systems to help withstand these extreme conditions. They've expanded vegetation management, line clearance, inspections, and system hardening and undergrounding. And yet we have even more sophisticated technologies and applications at our disposal, which are not being deployed at scale. Transmission ties between regions, grid enhancing technologies that allow for more visibility on those lines and distributed energy resources, which are all well-suited to providing resilience. 
demand response and other customer cited resources can provide crucial resilient services and be amplified with digitization. Nearly all of these technology solutions and applications are available today. While the US excels at technology innovation, policy is the crucial link and, it, link and is foundational to filling gaps, crossing valleys of death, scaling technologies, catalyzing industries, and sending market signals to the private sector that can then put, that, put to use that innovation. The infrastructure bill makes available significant funding for grid modernization, energy storage, and transmission, which are strong underpinnings for the clean energy transition and increased resilience of the grid but it will be essential to pass in the Senate what the House passed in the Build Back Better Act, which complements the infrastructure bill's direct funding with market mechanisms to spur private sector certainty and investment in resilience. A report from last month estimated that the cost of climate change in the US could reach 14.5 trillion by 2070. As a re recent Boston Globe headline read, compared with climate inaction, Build Back Better is downright cheap. In the Build Back Better bill is the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, which would be seeded by the government, but sit outside as a nonprofit to provide creative finance solutions for zero carbon technologies. State level green banks, which are structured on the state level in the same way that a national fund would be set up, are already financing critical energy infrastructure to ensure grid resilience and to support those most vulnerable to power outages. They're financing microgrids for local governments, clean backup power for affordable housing communities, and directly hardening structures against dam damaging weather caused by climate change. Rebates for electrification are part of Build Back Better and are a pathway to engaging customers and providing access to clean and safe technologies for low and middle income communities. If electrification is planned and deployed correctly, reliability and resilience should increase. One of the most important market tools is in the tax code. Access to tax credits will drive down the cost of energy storage of all types, opening up new markets in dozens of states and lowering the cost in states that already have storage targets. The tax credit inclusion of interconnection costs will help smaller community solar projects pencil out for neighborhoods where rooftops are not always suited to solar or where consumers do not own their own homes. The tax credit for microgrids will allow critical community services to operate when the grid goes down. The tax credit for transmission would increase resilience in the supply side of the grid, spurring nearly 40 billion in private sector investment in interregional transmission and mitigating losses such as those in the February 2021 polar vortex. Other programs include the Department of Energy's loan program that will open up to additional sectors like aviation and maritime that can scale the clean energy transition in other parts of our economy. But of course, if we truly wanna mitigate the climate crisis and deploy technologies that will be both re reliable and resilient, we need to not only execute well on the infrastructure bill and pass the Build Back Better Act, but we need targeted appropriations funding, regulatory signals through the Environmental Protection Agency, market structures through the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, in truth, all agencies in our government can take some responsibility within their missions for leading our nation to a safer, cleaner, more secure future from our climate crisis. And with our federal government aligned with the private sector's recognition that swift action must be taken on climate, there is far greater hope that we can reduce the impacts of this crisis on our nation. Thank you for the opportunity to present this testimony and I look forward to your questions. Well, thanks to all of our witnesses for your informative and insightful testimony. Uh, I'll recognize myself for the first five minutes for questions and start with um, focus back on the uh, bipartisan infrastructure law, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. And I, th I think what, what policymakers, what we were thinking about as we move forward with the grid resilience pieces is, is some win-win-win propositions. When you're strengthening the grid, you are making it more resilient to these climate-fueled disasters, these more frequent and intense um, weather events. We wanna lower the cost for consumers. We wanna create jobs, good American jobs. When you're talking about the grid, these are all American jobs. And then reduce greenhouse gas pollution. So now the DOE, the Department of Energy, will begin rolling out a lot of these monies uh, in partnership with communities in the private sector and, and, util and um, other uh, municipally owned, like Ms. Sutley Bronze. Uh, Ms. Hamilton, do you think we can do all of this and stay on the track uh, to, for affordability and reliability and resilience. Do you agree that they're not mutually exclusive? 
Yes, thank you for the question. They are absolutely not mutually exclusive. I absolutely agree with that. One thing we do have to think about though, and Mr. Graves mentioned this in his opening statement too, is that we do have to like plan for this. We have to think about what are all the pieces of this that are gonna work together, be the least cost options and keep prices down for customers. So you look at the supply side and how many clean energy technologies are available on that side from solar and wind certainly, but also hydropower, nuclear, geothermal. And then you look at the demand side, which is all the customers. Right. So doing demand response, energy efficiency, which is the cheapest form of energy and rooftop solar, battery storage, all of these technologies on the demand side that the customer can bring and then the connective tissue. So you think about energy storage, you think about transmission and all the technologies that enhance transmission to work better and then all the distribution technologies as well. All of these can be intertwined and allowed to work in real time using digitization. So. I think it's absolutely possible to do it all. And we have the technologies today. And I will tell you, I work with dozens of companies that want to invest and come and work with the government, partner with the government to make sure that we can do this in transition. Well, thank you. Ms. Sedley, your utility, uh, one of the largest municipally owned in the, in the country, you've set a 100% clean energy goal by 2035. Uh, how are you going to, to um, ensure that consumers are protected and yet you build in uh, clean energy resources over time? How are you, what is your plan? Well, thank you, uh, Chair Castor, for the question. Um, well, we, we absolutely take it as our responsibility to ensure that this transition happens in a way that protects our customers. And we work very hard to make sure that that's happening. Uh, we worked uh, with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory to analyze scenarios that would get us to 100% clean energy. And it was really informed by uh, a stakeholder group of uh, businesses and community leaders and members of the community uh, who helped us to kind of focus on the priorities uh, for the kinds of investments that will help Los Angeles uh, meet its goals and, and continue to flourish. And, and sort of as a follow on, uh, we started a process around equity strategies to make sure that all communities in Los Angeles uh, see the benefit of this of this transformation. Uh, but I would say that you know we have um, we have been meeting our, our financial targets. Uh, we've been uh, you know ma managing our rates uh, to try to protect our consumers. Um, we also offer a lot of programs that help uh, our customers save energy and save money. Uh, while, uh, while helping us to manage the grid better. Uh, and one of the things that we uh, found in the LA 100 study was that uh, electrification of, tr of transportation and of buildings can really help uh, to, to uh, manage costs by expanding uh, the sales of electricity uh, and helping us to manage costs. So this is first and foremost in our minds to make sure that we do this in a way that uh, protects uh, Los Angeles's economy, creates jobs, and uh, serves all of our communities. Great. Okay, next we'll go to uh, Ms. Miller. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chair Castor and Ranking Member Graves, and thank you to all the witnesses for being here today. Grid resilience is one of the most important aspects of our national energy strategy. And luckily, the United States has recently proven that it does not need to depend upon adversarial regimes to provide power to our constituents due to the boom in American produced energy over the last several decades. Under President Trump, America became a net energy exporters for the first time in a generation, selling our crude oil, natural gas and coal all over the world while providing everything we needed here at home. Unfortunately, this progress is under siege by radical activists who are pressuring the Biden administration to shut down American energy jobs and leave behind production focused communities. Look no further than President Biden nominating Sarah Bloom Raskin to serve as vice chair for supervision at the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System. Ms. Raskin is an anti-American energy activist whose vision for the Federal Reserve is to block or discourage traditional energy companies from accessing capital markets and the American banking system. 
Without the ability to finance costly upgrades, traditional energy companies will not be able to employ the future of carbon capture technology, leaving millions of Americans without jobs and the rest of our country reliant on either foreign imports from Russia and the Middle East or untested renewable energy that will never be able to supply the power that Americans have become accustomed to, all the while still relying on China to source most renewable technologies. We need smart policies to protect American energy producing communities and tackle the real problem, cutting carbon emissions. This won't be done by the federal government picking winners and losers, but instead through an all of the above energy strategy where we use American ingenuity and effective government incentives, not decades long subsidies and reliance on foreign competitors. Mr. Mills, in your testimony, you mentioned how essential it is for our energy infrastructure to be able to meet both expected and unexpected peaks in demand. Could you expand on what the scale of such an effort would look like for our country to fully rely on wind and solar technology? Uh, thank you, Congressman Miller. Uh, it's, uh, it's an interesting problem, the scale problem. I think everyone agrees the grid is it critical and needs to be reliable? The scale of America's grids, and there's not one grid, as everyone knows, is really uh, daunting to think in terms of supplying electricity from storage of any form, uh, in terms of storing electricity directly. If one were to calculate the quantity of minerals needed to produce enough batteries for the 12 hours I mentioned, and 12 hours is a typical number offered for grid scale storage for the United States, and today, just as a calibration point, the country has about one minute's worth of grid scale electricity in grid scale batteries stored at any given time. So we're you know, many thousands of percent away from getting to 12 hours. To get there would require mining more minerals that are now mined for all other purposes in the world for those batteries. There simply aren't enough mines yet. Doesn't mean we couldn't build the mines somewhere, but no one's proposing really to build the mines here. Congress has ordered and the administrations have looked at critical mineral dependencies now for roughly 60 years. This is not a new subject. The United States is 100% dependent on 17 minerals, imports more than half of another two dozen minerals. We are hostile to mineral expansion, mineral processing, and the related manufacturing in the United States. It's just a fact of the nature of the business for decades. It's sort of naive to think that we're gonna expand that kind of industry without radically increasing imports. In effect, Building battery assembly plants here, grid storage or for cars, is equivalent of building cars here and importing 100% of the gasoline. The you know, critical energy minerals are at the heart of the challenge uh, that the IEA has pointed out. I'm not the first to point this out. And it's a challenge that's not being taken up. And in fact, the IEA's latest paper, buried in about page 20 of its sort of victory lap on the expansion of wind, solar, and uh, electric cars in the last year, points out that the world is not now, no country is now expanding its uh, mineral production capability. Those that we are, uh, are do have it, of course, as I mentioned, is China are the, the biggest processors, Africa, South America. My homeland, Canada, produces lots of minerals, probably happy to produce more, but nobody's planning the scales needed. Thank you. You also mentioned the expansion of grid I'm scale. Sorry, I'm sorry, Ms. Miller, your, your time has expired. Thank you. And, and I'd also like to, to ask members uh, to please re refrain. I know we, we don't share all of the same views, but I'd ask that, that we not make any personal attacks uh, on any, any individual, especially they're, if they're not a party to, to our hearing today. And next we'll go to Rep Bonamici. You're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair uh, and Ranking Member Graves and our witnesses. And thank you, uh, Madam Chair, for, for noting that. I thought the comment was unnecessarily confrontational. We're here to have a debate about policy, not personal attacks. Um, so I'm, I'm here in the Pacific Northwest, and we are no stranger to extreme weather and natural disasters that stress our energy grid. And last summer, we had unprecedented heat waves sweep across Oregon and, and causing extreme precautions, including shutting down Portland's streetcars and light rail system to prevent equipment from melting. 
Portland General Electric, uh, and thank you for the shout out, uh, Ms. Wayland. Uh, PGE relied on a demand response program that helped prevent a worst case scenario. It's a program that compensates consumers and businesses for shifting energy use during peak demand. PGE estimates that this program saved uh, about 62 megawatts of power during the June 2021 heat wave, and that was enough to power 25,000 homes. So Ms. Whalen, what are some of the policy changes inhibiting utilities around the country from implementing their demand response programs or increasing consumer participation? That's a great question. Uh, when I was at the Department of Energy, I looked at um, the demand response capacity around the country, and it's quite significant, the amount of, of energy, even if you just look at large customers, not at um, ways that we can encourage smaller residential customers to be involved in demand response programs. And the, the, the delta between the demand response capacity and the actual contracts that we had was pretty large. And then the delta between the contracts that we had and what was actually delivered when called upon was also pretty large. So I think that there are um, a number of both regulatory pricing structures that signals that can be sent, but also um, encouraging uh, customers to join these programs and also um, encouraging uh, third party aggregators to go out looking for those customers. And I think what you'll see with um, FERC order 2222 is a, a growth in the, um, aggregators who are going out and looking for those distributed energy resources, whether they're going to bundle them into the wholesale market for power or for demand response programs. So there's a number of, of things that can be done um, there with demand response. And, and I do think that what we'll see um, uh, increasingly is the smaller customers becoming part of demand response programs as a result of, and these would be active load management programs, but as a result of smart um, appliances and smart thermostats and ways that that residential customers can participate and, and benefit and earn money from participating in these programs, but do it in a way that they don't have to think about it, where it's really um, automated. And again, that, that um, only happens if we have a very smart grid that allows communication with these customers. Exactly. So the um, flexibility funding, the smart grid investment grant flexibility funding, and the broadband funding, and of course, broadband is going to be the backbone of a smart grid in the future, whether it's wireless or fiber. Um, and the funding in the bipartisan infrastructure law will actually help support uh, demand response programs. Terrific, thank you so much. Um, so, so this year, coal will account for about 85% of electric uh, generation capacity retirements, while solar and wind are projected to account for about 63% of new capacity. Investing in the bulk power system has been and will continue to be critical to a resilient grid, especially as polluting base load generation is taken offline and replaced by renewable resources. So I want to ask you, Ms. Hamilton, in your testimony, you mentioned the importance of building interregional transmission lines, how would ratepayers benefit from transmission build out and how does the Build Back Better help us, uh, Build Back Better Act help us with this goal? And thank you for, for pointing out in your written testimony and your oral testimony, the Boston Globe article that said, compared with climate inaction, Build Back Better is downright cheap. So will you please talk about um, how ratepayers would benefit from that transmission build out and how Build Back Better would help? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for the question. So there was a recently released grid strategies report that says for every dollar invested in transmission, customers see $3 in benefits. And that's because it keeps the prices down for customers. You're able to move electricity to places that have a lot of resource to places that have a lot of load. And you can do that in real time with a lot of different technologies that are available today. So for example, you look at what we have in our nation today, and a lot of our systems are very isolated from other systems. Right now, there is no connection, a seam between MISO in the Midwest and PJM, which has an enormous amount of load. So like, let's build a transmission tie there to move all that great wind out of Iowa into Chicago that's gonna need it, especially with their new goals. Um, and so what we need to do, and when you look at Texas and, and the lack of ties that they had um, during the polar vor vortex, how difficult that was for them to manage the system. Whereas in MISO across Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Indiana, there were more transmission ties. They were able to import 15 times more power than Texas was simply because they had transmission ties. So transmission is incredibly important. And I think if we look at transmission overlaid with our rail, with our highway rights of ways, there are plenty of ways to get transmission built. And if you look at what right now is in the infrastructure bill, there are certainly programs that are gonna be able to incentivize that and allow us to be catalytic. So 
perhaps funding one project will lead to not just that project being built, but really catalyze multiple projects after that by sending the signal to the private sector that you can build transmission now. That's great. Thank you. And my time has expired. I yield back. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Next up, Rep Gonzalez, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to our witnesses. Uh, I want to start by submitting for the record from Stanford University uh, an assessment of the Diablo Canyon Canyon nuclear plant for zero carbon electricity, desalination, and hydrogen production, for the record. Okay, with that objection, so we're not. Thank you. Um, I want to first just cite something from there. We've talked about the impact that Diablo Canyon could have on California's energy. Um, this report analyzed included that keeping Diablo Canyon running would, quote, significantly reduce California's use of natural gas for electricity and save $2.6 billion in costs to the state's power system from 2025 to 2035. Uh, additionally, uh, if closed, a carbon-free electrical system in California in 2045 would need 18 gigawatts of PV solar and 11 gigawatts of energy storage. Uh, the additional capacity of solar to replace Diablo Canyon would take up 90,000 acres of land. By comparison, the footprint at Diablo Canyon is just 900 acres and only 140 acres for the plant itself. So hopefully that provides some context for folks. Uh, I think shutting down any nuclear plant in this country is insane, um, yet it's something that people continue to do for some reason. So uh, that being the case, um, we obviously disagree on policy, uh, but I do believe all of us here believe American families and businesses deserve access to affordable, reliable, and resilient energy. Uh, that's why I've been an advocate for generating electricity from a diverse set of energy sources including nuclear. You all are probably sick of me saying it at that point, but I just think it's a no-brainer. Um, Mr. Mills, in, in your testimony, you highlighted a case study that I, I bring up quite frequently at this committee, and that's Germany's high-priced transition to renewables. Uh, in Germany, wind and solar make up roughly 20% of the energy mix and supply anywhere from a negligible amount to roughly half of all demand during certain sunny and windy hours. These large fluctuations require backup from other power plants, typically coal or gas-fired, uh, or increased electricity imports. And as you noted in your testimony, all this variability can cause serious disruptions in electricity flow and thus dramatically raise consumers' prices without a significant reduction in emissions. Now, when I raise these concerns and specifically cite the emissions and cost data from Germany, one response I often hear is that because the U.S.'s geography and resources are dramatically different than Germany's, there's no reason for us to be concerned with the consequences of pursuing the exact same policies. Some would suggest, hey, it's sunny in Arizona, so that should work fine in Northeast Ohio. I would argue that's also kind of crazy. Can you help us understand why it would be a mistake for the U.S. to support and implement the same renewable energy strategy as Germany? Well, I, I encounter the same um, comments, uh, Congressman Gonzalez. And I think the answer, first of all, is that the European grid does have a lot of inner ties there. It's, a, it's a, a fairly integrated set of grids among many countries. The geography of uh, continental Europe from its south to its north is very similar in terms of the latitude and therefore solar insulence, very similar in terms of wind. Uh, some of the challenges there inter-country are, um, are moderated, much like we have here with our FERC. So uh, the reality is in terms of the primary resource, wind and sun, if that's a, it, where most of the uh, expanded capacity is focused, it's not very different, continental United States and uh, continental Europe. And the other reality is, of course, that Germany has done the experiment for us, as has England, where if you, you provide reliability by essentially building two grids, and even if the two sources of electricity, broadly speaking, the hydrocarbon traditional sources and the newer sources, wind and solar, were the same price, you've by definition roughly doubled the cost of, of the supply system. And you increase costs because you need more inner ties. It's, I think we do and should have more inner ties, but you need more of them. And then you have to uh, underutilize the, we'll call it the old grid, underutilized assets cost more per unit of energy delivered and actually have operational structural cost increases on grids when you start doing cycling of these assets. Thank so thank they've you. done the experiment and it, it does cost more. I, I think people need to be honest about the fact that it just costs more, not, not thank less. You. And with my final 30 seconds, um, the suggestion that we can just send 
solar power from places like Arizona all over the country. Uh, and that's somehow a solution to our grid challenges. That's sort of silly, right? I, well, it's you can do it, but it exposes it costs a lot of money and exposes the long transmission lines to precisely the extreme weather events people are worried about. Uh, it's expensive and it doesn't guarantee we'll have enough of the physical resource available when required for the exact meteorological reasons I pointed out in my testimony. Thank you for your, te for your responses and I yield back. Next, we'll go to Rep Brownlee. You're recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for um, pulling us together for this important uh, hearing. I appreciate it very, very much. Um, Ms. Sutley, I wanted to, I was particularly interested in your, um, particularly your written testimony and uh, talking about green hydrogen, and not only in terms of uh, getting to your 2035 goal, but also in terms of, you know, reliability in and of itself. So I'm sort of curious, is um, the use of green hydrogen, is there Obviously, to expand your renewable energy options in your portfolio has got to be one reason, certainly. But I, I was curious to know, is there something special um, around green hydrogen when you're talking about reliability other than just its availability? Oh, thank you. Um, you know, when we looked at the, uh, well, the LA100 study looked at what was necessary to get us to 100% renewable energy, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory pointed out that we, we do need dispatchable capacity, as, as Mr. Mills was mentioning. Uh, we agree with that. Uh, but one way to provide that is with green hydrogen. Uh, we, we understand from the people involved in the technology that, you know, a certain amount can be blended in to a, a, a power plant today. Um, and that, uh, you know, that the technology is, is evolving to ensure that we can use 100% uh, green hydrogen in a, in a combustion turbine in the, in the future. And so that would provide that uh, dispatchable capacity the, the LA100 study also pointed out that, uh, that it would be different than we use our uh, natural gas power plants today in the LA basin, uh, where they run much of the time, uh, probably 30% of the time, to where we would be using that dispatchable capacity um, infrequently in times of very high demand or where there was an interruption uh, in, in for some reason uh, in the grid uh, where we couldn't import um, some of the renewable energy that comes from outside of the Los Angeles basin. So uh, the other thing is uh, we have a, uh, we are part of a consortium that's retiring a coal plant in Utah uh, and are looking uh, at green hydrogen uh, and the ability to actually make it on site through electrolysis and store it on site and potentially provide seasonal storage of renewable, uh, excess renewables, so that that renewable energy, when it's available, can be used to make the green hydrogen. And then uh, at that particular site, we can, so we can store the green hydrogen on site and use it uh, when it's needed for the grid. And I, I noticed in your testimony too, in terms of storage of that, it's in uh, salt uh, caverns um, that Utah um, has. Um, but that's got to be a, a, a cheap way, I would imagine, in terms of storing um, energy. Well, it's a yeah. That that may be some. There's maybe some particular things about that site that are particularly attractive. Yeah. Uh, but we also think a good opportunity to show how this technology could work. There are extensive uh, salt caverns uh, underneath this this power plant. There's there's water. There's uh, gas lines. There's uh, power lines that bring renewable energy both into that area and then uh, energy from the plant uh, into Southern California. Uh, so it's sort of an ideal place uh, to, to do this kind of project. And when do you think you'll get to 100% green hydrogen? Um, well, at that plant, uh, the, the new turbines are coming in in 2025 and they'll be capable of burning about 30% hydrogen at the uh, at the day they're turned on. Uh, and as uh, over the next decade or so, as it goes through its uh, maintenance cycles, uh, the plan is to, to uh, kind of convert uh, it in the, probably in the mid 2030s 
uh, to something that can run on 100% green hydrogen. Great, thank you so much. And uh, Ms. Hamilton, I, I have a, about 30 seconds left, but um, you know, in your testimony, you really talked about uh, micro microgrids and certainly they're uh, very important when we're talking about resiliency and uh, reliability. And I was particularly uh, interested in, you gave a couple of different examples. Um, and one of those examples was the Sonoma Valley Unified School District in terms of what they, what they are doing. And, I'm a former school board member, and uh, so I can't get away from get away from it uh, too far. But you know, just and thinking about that and the possibilities of microgrids being, you know, judiciously spread across, particularly in the state of California, when we're thinking about that, seems to be um, a great win-win opportunity. And, and actually, school districts could actually perhaps earn some revenue in terms of uh, education for their kids. So. Do you agree with all of that and that assessment? I, I do. Not only can they bring solar online, they can earn more money by participating in the wholesale market and they can charge electric school buses. And if you've ever sat in the back of a school bus, you know it's stinky. And electric school buses are really the way to go for these school districts. And the microgrid supports all of those. Thank you so much. Um, and Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you. Next up, uh, Rep Carter, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank all the witnesses for being here. I'll go ahead and get this out of the way. Georgia is the number one forestry state in the nation, and I'm very proud of that. Thank you, Ranking Member Graves, for bringing that to my attention before I get started. Mr. Mills, I, I wanted to direct some uh, questions to you. Look, we all agree. We all agree that uh, we need to modernize our grid. Everybody here, we, we disagree on how we do it, but we all agree we need to modernize it. I don't think there's any question about that. We know that our economy is um, electrifying more and more. And as a result of that, we've got to have both generating capacity and grid capacity. And we've got to increase that significantly. And, and, and again, I think everybody agrees with that. You make that point, Mr. Mills, in your testimony. And I appreciate that very much. And I, I'm not against using any particular or any specific type of, uh, of form of generation, uh, whether it be wind, solar, or whatever. I'm an all of the above type guy as far as the energy goes, but the reliability and the resiliency are, are extremely important to me and, and also the affordability. You just mentioned when we were talking about getting solar power from Arizona and, and you know, the, the cost of the transmission lines, obviously that is something that would deter us. I mean, it, that, that makes sense to anybody. I think the third grader could understand that. But um, you also mentioned uh, in your testimony that the, the if we were to primarily switch to solar and, and wind, that the battery storage would um, that's necessary for 12 hours, we would need to spend almost a trillion dollars on batteries alone. Not to mention how we make those batteries, the energy that it takes, and to make those batteries and what we do after they're no longer being used. Those are things we should consider as well. But the one thing that I'm, I'm really concerned about, again, is the reliability and the resiliency. And I, I wanted to ask you, you understand just like all of us do what's going on right now with rising energy costs. You've seen it, we've all seen it. In light of that, um, what can we expect to happen if the electricity rates, two electricity rates, I should say, if we were to make such a transition as some have described here, and that is to try to go totally to wind and solar and, and, and do away with all the other sources. Well, uh, thank you, Congressman. I think we know the answer because it's already happening uh, in the United States and around the world. Electric rates are going up, not down. And there's a one-to-one -one correlation in European nations and in the United States. Uh, in U.S. regions, as more wind and solar capacity is added per capita, uh, electric rates are going up. It's not, and that's not a, a subsidy effect in the sense the subsidies are should keep the rates down because the capital costs are shifted from the rate payers to taxpayers broadly. That's where the subsidies come from. So the the fact that electric rates are rising, in fact, in Excel service territory, they've gone from a few percent wind plus solar to about, I think they're at 10 or 12 percent now, maybe 15. And the average cost of electricity for the average homeowner has gone from $800 a year to $1,600 a year. So, you know, they're following the path that commission wants and that we all 
would like to have more wind and solar, but it, it costs more money. It has been costing more money. The idea that it'll get cheaper in the future is entirely anchored on forecasts, not an experience. What's actually happening is solar module prices have gone up 50% in the last two years. Battery costs are forecast to rise this year. Wind turbine costs have stopped, prices have stopped going down, are gonna rise slightly this year, all because of the commodity inputs for them. Commodities account for 60 to 70% of the cost of making solar panels, about 30% of the cost of making wind turbines. When commodity prices escalate, it ripples through. That ripples through other things too, for fertilizing right, food. Right. But that's the I, path I, I've that we're on. I've just got a minute left, and, and you just answered my second question. I appreciate that about the right. increase in cost, and, 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 and obviously we all understand that. But how can we ensure that our transition, if we were to transition too quickly, obviously we're going to quit, we're going to bring into light the reliability and the affordability. But how can we transition significantly investing in the grid in a way that doesn't necessarily put this undue pressure on electricity rates and, and, and how we could reduce affordability? Well, so I'm sorry, the answer is to go slower and no one likes that answer because to get the cost down of the technologies we'd like, they're gonna take a lot longer to get cheap. Just met, mentioned quickly, hydrogen on a unit of energy delivered basis is about 300% more expensive than natural gas. There's no path to making hydrogen as cheap as natural gas, anywhere visible in any of the physics or physical chemistry. So it, it works, you can electrolyze water and make hydrogen. Uh, it doesn't matter that you use solar panels to do that. It produces very expensive energy. It's a solution. I like hydrogen uh, fuel cells personally. We can burn it in engines, which yes, is very are. expensive. Good. I know I'm out of time and I'll yield back, but thank you, Mr. Mills, for making what I consider to be very important points. Uh, look, we all want the same thing, but how we get there is, I think, where we differ. All right. Uh, next up is uh, Rep Huffman from the Redwood Forest. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair. Wanted to show you a little bit about what what California really looks like. It's not this, you know, doom and gloom place that some of my colleagues have been describing. Uh, in fact, uh, I'm sitting here in my home, uh, powered 100% by uh, renewable energy right now, and the lights are still on, and I, I think my connection is still working. It's, it's amazing, this, this alchemy, this magic we've been able to achieve in California, uh, contrary to all of the anti-renewable doom and gloom, we continue to hear from the other side who for some reason thinks that we got to go slow and we should not go too fast in this transition to clean energy. Uh, let's keep in mind, we've got a climate crisis out there and uh, there's an enormous cost of making this transition too slowly. We should talk about that cost as well. But look, I don't want Mr. Carter to be the only one to brag about his state. Uh, we hear a lot about the beautiful state of Georgia, Mr. Carter, uh, but let me tell you a little about uh, California right now. In real time, we have this wonderful website uh, that our grid operator, the California ISO, uh, puts out there. Uh, you can go to caiso.com, caso.com, and you can see that right now, as I'm talking to you, uh, we have a current demand of a little over 22,000 megawatts. Over 70% of that demand right now in real time is being met by renewable energy, and somehow, the California economy, fifth largest economy in the world, uh, is plugging right along. Only about 9% of our energy in this moment is imported, contrary to some of these claims about our extreme dependence on imported energy. Um, we've got an increasing amount of battery storage that is helping uh, keep our grid working. None of it is uh, contributing to our load right now because the sun is shining and the wind is blowing, and so we're charging those batteries. And as we go forward, those batteries, as well as our hydro and our other uh, assets, in, including um, geothermal, which is about 5.5% of our load right now as we speak, uh, are gonna keep our grid balanced. And in fact, uh, the grid has never failed here uh, because we had too much renewables. This is a canard. This is a myth that we continue to hear. In fact, I'm not aware of any grids failing anywhere because there were too much renewables. I am aware of Tucker Carlson and Ted Cruz and Republicans claiming that the Texas failure uh, last year was because of too much wind, uh, but that just forced the fact checker checkers to totally debunk that. The turbines kept working, the wind worked just fine, 
It was in fact a deregulated grid that depended on some really uh, neglected fossil fuel infrastructure that brought all of the reliability problems in Texas. So uh, we do a lot of debunking and fact checking when we try to have a forward looking conversation in this committee. Uh, and I needed to uh, cover some of those bases. But I wanna bring this back to Nancy Sutley. Uh, we're proud of the fact that LADWP is one of the nation's largest utilities and you've set these great goals. Uh, for 100% clean energy. How are you going to make this magic alchemy happen without crashing your grid, as we've you know, heard all these warnings about too much renewables? Uh, well, thank you, uh, Mr. Huffman, um, for the question. Uh, well, I, I'd say a couple of things. First of all, uh, we, we have this uh, uh, LA100 study done for us by the uh, National Renewable Energy Laboratory. They literally looked at thousands of scenarios and modeled LA's grid of it, literally down to the building level uh, and came up with a number of scenarios that would get us to 100% clean energy reliably, affordably, and equitably, um, including by the 2030. 2035, the, the state's current goal is, is 2045 for 100% clean energy grid. Um, and then the, the second thing is that, you know, we, we have been making these investments uh, in renewable energy. Uh, we have brought online a number of new projects, uh, including some of the cheapest solar um, to date and uh, wind, cheapest wind to date. Uh, we are, we have invested in storage. We've sort of repurposed a hydro pump storage project that was built in the 1980s uh, to work uh, alongside the renewable energy to provide that sort of longer duration uh, duration storage. And we're investing in sort of management uh, of the grid. And we believe that even, uh, and the kind of our current investment path uh, that we can get to um, about 80% renewables by 2030 and 97% greenhouse gas free. So looking at a diverse energy source, diverse energy, diverse clean energy sources um, and continuing to invest in our grid uh, to, to protect reliability and to invest in electrification and energy efficiency and demand management that help our customers help us manage the grid. So. We, Thank you. Uh, we believe um, this is all possible. Thank I, you. I realize, Madam Chair, I'm out of time. I, I had another question I wanted to ask other witnesses about uh, some of the microgrids we've begun to deploy and the big grid, little grid um, uh, issue. If there's a second round, I'll, I'll hang around for that, but I'm out of time and I will yield back. Thank you, Rep Huffman. Uh, next, Rep Palmer, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I thank the witnesses and uh, Ranking Member Graves. Uh, Mr. Mills, uh, New York Times put out an article last week, a couple of weeks ago maybe, that showed uh, where we would have to locate solar uh, farms and wind farms for generating the, the power that the nation would need to run on. And uh, a lot of that was in the Midwest. Would that not create some major eminent domain issues? I'm sorry, what kind of issues, Congressman? I apologize. Eminent domain. Oh, yeah, I think, well, certainly the, this administration and previous ones have struggled with the eminent domain challenges with building any large scale facilities that take acres and acres or millions of acres. Transmission line has uh, is, is failed serially to get uh, clean hydro from Canada down into New York City. Uh, so the opposition to using large areas of land to wind and solar is rising, but that's that. That, uh, call, you know, everyone's familiar with the NIMBY challenge. Uh, it's not new. Yeah, I think it'll become more severe as we expand the uh, use of wind and solar. Sure. Well, it already has with transmission lines and sure. certainly taking an enormous amount of land to um, site these uh, solar farms and these wind farms. The other thing is, is uh, you uh, are involved in engineering. I work for two international engineering companies. Just from an engineering feasibility perspective, uh, from from my understanding of, of engineering, it's not feasible to build this out uh, in 13 years by 2035. Well, not at the national level, it's not. There's not enough construction capacity to do it. 
Um, and as we push the construction capacity hard, uh, you get price escalation, you get labor cost escalation, and materials escalation. And uh, if I material shortages, as you've already pointed out, and uh, particularly in um, uh, rare earth elements, as uh, you pointed out, half of that is controlled by China. And I think we get 80% of our rare earth element uh, material from China. Right. And, uh, but Finland, uh, you, in, in one of the articles that you wrote, you quoted the geological survey by the Finnish government about uh, uh, the capacity uh, for providing the other materials. I mean, just basic materials. Could you comment on that? Oh, certainly. And, I, and just for the record, you know, I, <laughs> I've worked in worked for dozens of utilities over the years. I have to I some of the most impressive engineering anywhere on the planet is in American utilities. They've kept the lights on, uh, as, as uh, Congressman has uh, observed, and done so with uh, under duress many times, both from nature and from human nature. What the Finnish uh, geological survey did was look at the global plans. Many countries are emulating what the United States is talking about to do a transition to using lots more wind, solar, and batteries and water electrolysis, we can throw that in as well. And they calculated the existing availability of known reserves of minerals, copper, nickel, lithium, cobalt, not just the rare earths. And their conclusion, and this is not an anti-renewable energy conclusion, it's simply an analysis. The same one was done in the Dutch government at uh, the Delft University. The world doesn't have enough proved reserves, not just mines, right. of the minerals that are needed to fabricate all the machines that are being contemplated right now. But wouldn't it make more sense to utilize next generation nuclear, which can utilize uh, and, and uh, uh, recycle spent fuel rods, instead of putting all of our eggs in this renewable basket? Uh, and, it's, and it seems even dumber to me that the Biden administration is, is uh, uh, rejecting or rescinding permitting for a nickel and cobalt mine in Minnesota when we know you have to have that to build these facilities. Does well, that make sense? Yeah, we need a lot more. I'm a, I'm a nuclear ball. I, I think there's a, a tremendous opportunity for more both small and, and large nuclear plants. I'm also very bullish on literally doubling the amount of solar wind capacity in America, more than tripling the battery capacities on grids. This is going to happen. It's useful. The what I challenge is a future that is fully dependent on that because the data don't show that's possible. Nuclear has a very important role in all this. Well, that's the point that I wanted to make. And you look at what's happened in the UK and, and in Germany and how much household utility costs have gone up, uh, gone up how it's impacted the lives of particularly lower income people. It's literally created energy poverty right. uh, in, in Europe and the UK. And, and it has here to a certain extent as well. Uh, with that, Madam Chairman, I yield back. Great. Thanks, Rep. Palmer. And um, fortunately, in the bipartisan infrastructure law, we were thinking uh, ahead, and it includes some new policy direction on uh, pre-siting consultation to try to avoid any problems with, and, and that includes uh, citing backstop authority for DOE, because there are issues when you're trying to, to plan uh, interstate uh, power lines and transmission lines. And I hope somebody will ask our e experts to expand on that as well. Uh, next, we'll go to Rep McEachin. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And again, I wanna thank you for, for your uh, marvelous leadership of this committee and for having this uh, hearing today. Um, the Congress, this Congress at least, and the Bi Biden administration have taken steps through the bipartisan infrastructure law to increase the reliability and resilience of our grid in the face of extreme weather events and uh, significant risks that are posed to our nation's electric grid. These investments are critical. And I look forward to the continued work with my colleagues to implement these investments and ensure continued efforts to make our grid more resilient and reliable, including those included in the Select Committee's Majority Staff Report. Ms. Sutley, environmental justice communities are on the front lines of the climate crisis. In your testimony, you explained that moving to a zero carbon grid will help reduce air pollution, including nitrogen oxides and fine uh, particulate matter. Can you explain how this process might play out? Well, thank you, uh, 
representative for the question. Yes, we, we've seen here in Los Angeles, uh, we still have the worst air quality in the nation. Uh, smog and particular matter pollution affects many of our communities, particularly low income and disadvantaged communities. But most of it right now is coming from uh, transportation sector. Uh, it's coming from the cars on the road, the trucks and buses and the uh, goods movement coming out of the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach. Uh, and so as the grid gets cleaner and cleaner, electrification of those uh, transportation sources uh, will help to get rid of the largest sources of smog pollution, other toxic air pollution that's affecting our communities. So uh, we believe that uh, even today, uh, uh, electric vehicles uh, or other electric equipment um, today, even with the, the power uh, mix on our grid is uh, up to four times cleaner than the uh, diesel or gasoline power vehicles that are on the road today. So uh, we are able, uh, as we electrify to address the major sources of air pollution that are harming our, our communities. And let me ask you this question, ma'am, if I can. You know, we're doing the, or trying to invest to do the very important work of grid resilience and grid reliability. As we do that, how do we also advance the cause of environmental justice? Well, we are, we are right now uh, engaged in a, a community based and community led effort around equity strategies as we implement these uh, uh, policies and these programs to get us to 100% clean energy. Uh, we've really tried to uh, make sure that uh, all of our communities are benefiting from these investments. So, for example, uh, you know, many of uh, many residents in Los Angeles are uh, renters. Uh, they live in apartments and can't necessarily put a solar panel on their roof. Uh, so, we've created a shared solar program where uh, apartment dwellers can take advantage of solar energy. Uh, we are also uh, investing in uh, uh, in electric vehicle charging infrastructure in disadvantaged communities. Uh, so for example, we, uh, we have a customer service center in uh, the Crenshaw neighborhood of South Los Angeles, uh, where we've installed a number of electric vehicle chargers that are available to the community. And they're very popular and you're used all the time. So I think uh, in the case, what we're trying to do is really be deliberate about uh, addressing the needs of the community uh, and taking the input of the community to do that. Yeah. Um, with an organization like yours, how can this Congress or any Congress be a strong partner to help you in your efforts to advance environmental justice? In other words, what else can we do or what else should we be thinking about? Well, as I said, the, the biggest sort of bang for the buck on that right now is to, to reduce the, uh, the pollution coming out of our transportation sector and electrification really offers a pathway to do that uh, in a cost-effective way. Uh, and so the, the investments uh, that the Congress made in the bipartisan infrastructure law and, and contemplated in, in uh, Build Back Better as well, uh, will go a long way to building both the uh, charging network uh, that will allow that large scale uh, electrification of transportation um, and, and, and also support uh, um, the vehicles uh, being on the road today. Thank you. I, I think Los Angeles is lucky to have you. Thank you for all your hard work. And Madam Chair, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Rep McEachin. Next up, Rep Armstrong. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you, Mr. Mills, for talking a little bit about the economics of hydrogen. Hydrogen is a great uh, fuel source. The problem is you can't economically scale up the electrolysis for green hydrogen without it being unbelievably expensive to consumers under current technology. And if you use gray hydrogen, you need to have natural gas as a feedstock, which while very effective, uh, makes it a little, one, doesn't help the carbon emissions as much, and two, it's pretty hard to compete with natural gas when you're using natural gas as a feedstock, regardless of the price of natural gas. But in the majority's memo for this hearing highlights a previous staff report that recommends backup storage as a means to address instances when intermittent generation sources are unable to provide electricity essentially when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine. And we've seen this argument before. Proponents of widespread renewable deployment advocate that batteries are the answer when the sources are completely offline. But this argument ignores the reality of our technological, material, and production uh, limitations. 
And Mr. Mills, when you've written on this topic, you've often framed the scale of this problem using the world's largest battery manufacturing facility, the Tesla Gigantifactory in Nevada. Using current levels of production, approximately how long would it take to produce the number of batteries to store two days worth of US electricity demand? Well, the short, an short answer is centuries, or put differently, you have to increase by a hundredfold the global manufacturing capacity, which, which is not happening uh, because it can't happen. Well, and your critics argue that, right? With additional battery facilities right. will be built over the next decade to add to this sure. production. But it completely ignores the rela reliability of, or the reality of global supply chains and the av available of essential materials like, I mean, lithium, cobalt, just to name a few. Well, it, that's correct. And I, I want to, again, go on the record of pointing, pointing out that I'm, I'm reflecting uh, observations about mineral supplies made by the UN, by geological surveys in European nations, by the EU itself, by the way, and by the IEA's magnificently long and detailed report on the minerals required they published last year to well, and, I, and I say that a lot in this hearing and others. And I, I, I think one of the fundamental things that I get so frustrated with is a lot of our policy seems to be outsourcing our guilt. <laughs> I mean, by your admissions, right, we're going to have to increase lithium mining by at least 500 percent worldwide. Right. And I mean, given the regulatory hostility in the United States, do you think it's realistic that we can onshore that production? No, um, it, the average time to open a new mine anywhere in the world is 16 years average. The United States is far longer. Uh, lines have been canceled recently. The, this administration canceled the Minnesota copper uh, uh, cobalt mine, copper nickel mine uh, just uh, a week and a half ago. So I, I, just a practical matter, even if we were all enthusiastic as I am, I worked for a mining company in Canada years ago. I'm, I'm bullish on mining. I think we should open more mines here. I think we should require more mining here as a condition of more green energy machines being built here. I think we should link them personally, uh, but it will take decades, not a few years to expand mining capacity, not only here, but globally. Well, and I think we're seeing that in real time right now and the impacts of the global supply chain uh, with the United States almost entirely dependent on what I would call our strategic global ad adversaries for critical minerals. I mean, palladium is an essential material used for yeah. catalytic converters, to clean auto emissions. Correct. And Russia, Russia is currently the largest producer of palladium. In fact, they produce more than the next four countries combined. And just in the real world, how this is working today, as tensions on the Ukrainian border have increased over the last two months, so have palladium prices, simply due to market making assumptions about future access. With news this morning that the Russian troops near the Ukraine might be returning to their bases, palladium slid 5%. What happens when something beyond market forces limits the availability or alters the price of these materials, particularly when they are produced by our strategic adversaries and we have no realistic way to onshore them? Well, we have a realistic way to onshore a lot more of it. It just takes time. That's why it wasn't being facetious about going slower. We can't build these things faster. We have to recognize, not as a policy matter, that we should slow down. I think we have to recognize the velocity with which global scale mining and manufacturing can expand to our aspirations. We should expand them. I think we should try to accelerate them, but I don't think they can go at the pace people imagine. America has plenty of minerals. The United States just hasn't had the appetite to provide the right incentives to expand mineral processing and mining. And both are required, not just the mining, but the very difficult chemical processing that happens after you dig up the rocks is something else that we're not a very friendly nation to the expansion of those kinds of industries. And I agree with that. I mean, we have a lot of lignite um, coal in North Dakota. We got a lot of people who do a really good job of getting that out of the ground. It also happens to be pretty high in rare earth metals. But I, my dad used to tell me this when we were hunting when I was a kid. He said, slow is steady and steady is fast. And with that, I'll yield back. Okay, thank you. Next up, uh, Rep Levin, you're recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chair Castor. Uh, I wanted to start off with what I believe has been a great California success story, uh, and that's the expansion of roof, rooftop solar in the state of California. And, and uh, Ms. Sutley, it's, it's good to see you. I'll start with you. I think, uh, as you know, across California, we now have 1.3 million uh, Californians who've installed a total of about 10 gigawatts of rooftop and home-based solar. Uh, and in your testimony, you reference how uh, NREL recently completed its LA100 study, which examines various scenarios for how Los Angeles can reach 100% uh, carbon-free energy 
uh, by 2035. The study covers how LA alone has over 13 gigawatts of solar rooftop potential, over half of which is the residential sector. Uh, could you discuss the role that rooftop solar coupled with energy storage needs to play for LA to meet its clean energy and grid resilience goals? Yeah, thank you, uh, Representative Levin, nice to see you. Um, appreciate the question. Yeah, there's no question that rooftop solar uh, will play an important role in us meeting our clean energy goals. Uh, Los Angeles is, uh, is proud to be the number one solar city in the, in the country. And uh, we have long supported uh, our customers uh, in uh, embracing uh, rooftop solar uh, through the uh, California Solar Initiative and <clears throat> solar incentive programs. Uh, we have a, a feed-in tariff program uh, that really looks at uh, sort of a power purchase agreement with us to, uh, you know, to incentivize uh, solar on, uh, for example, warehouse roofs. We have a lot of those in, in Los Angeles, um, as well as recognizing, as I mentioned, that 60% uh, of our residents live in, in multifamily dwellings. And so we have to design other kinds of solar programs to, to ensure that folks can uh, access the benefits of solar energy through our shared solar program, as well as the uh, uh, solar rooftop uh, leasing program um, to basically lease people's roofs uh, for solar uh, that they might otherwise not be able to um, afford to put on their own roof. Uh, so it's been a very successful program, but I think it, it recognizes, uh, and the annual study recognizes that we need that local generating capacity here in the Los Angeles basin. Um, we do uh, get a lot of our power imported, uh, and that's been going on now for uh, many decades. Uh, coal plant, uh, it used to be coal plants in, uh, in <clears throat> Arizona, Nevada, and, and Utah, uh, and now increasingly solar uh, and wind coming from other parts of California, uh, as well as uh, from other, other Western states. Uh, and we do have the transmission to support that, but, but really for that to maintain resilience and reliability, we need uh, local, so local sources of generation, including rooftop solar. Uh, and uh, we're fortunate in Los Angeles, uh, we have you know, 350 plus days of, of sunshine a year. Uh, and makes it an ideal place uh, to really uh, make rooftop solar a critical part of our energy future. Fantastic. Thank you for that. And I, uh, I'm glad that the California PUC has indefinitely postponed its uh, uh, changes to net metering, uh, because I want to make sure that uh, as we look at the federal level to make investments in clean energy, that California continue to adopt policies that really keep a rooftop solar deployment growing rather than undermining that growth. Uh, Ms. Hamilton, I'll turn to you. It's nice to see you. Uh, as uh, my colleagues have discussed, uh, the bipartisan infrastructure law included a lot of funding to modernize our grid and to advance energy storage. And in your testimony, you discussed how the investment tax credit included in the House Build Back Better Act uh, would help drive down the cost of energy storage and solar and transmission. Uh, I'd also like to note the inclusion of direct pay provisions. I've been advocating for that, uh, really building on uh, something that uh, Earl Blumenauer and I introduced, the Renewable Energy Investment Act. Direct pay, I think, is particularly important as we continue our economic recovery since the volatility driven by the pandemic has made it more challenging to finance clean energy projects. Uh, with the time I have left, could you elaborate on uh, why this is all critical. These tax policies are critical in building grid, grid resilience. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for the question, Mr. Levin. Um, the tax credits will send the signal to the private market and, and direct pay is incredibly important for those people who do not have a tax burden. And so as you're talking about rooftop solar, there's a 10% bonus credit for rooftop solar for people in low income communities. And there's a 20% for community solar for low income communities. That is incredibly important and direct pay will help those people who don't have tax burdens to be able to take advantage of those kinds of systems. The other thing is for energy storage, you know, there are a lot of technologies other than batteries. There are long duration storage projects, including in uh, Mr. Carter's state of Georgia, Georgia Power is proposing in their, in their um, integrated resource plan to install a long duration storage battery that will accommodate seasonal storage. That is the kind of project that will also benefit from a tax credit. And their investors, 
and I've worked for it, a private equity company before, will say, this means we are ready to invest and we're ready to move forward on these technologies. So having the tax code signal that to the private sector is really crucial. Thank you. I'm out of time, but I thank you both for your leadership and I'll yield back, Chair. Thank you, Rep. Levin. Uh, next, Rep. Crenshaw, you're, well, you're recognized for five minutes. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the witnesses. Um, you know, I just want to address this, this notion that we should sprint to uh, what are inherently unreliable forms of weather-dependent energy. Uh, and the, 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 the narrative goes something like this. We have to sprint there because uh, there's a crisis and it's an emergency. Uh, I, I, I would challenge my colleagues to point out uh, where in the UN IPCC report, it says there's a climate crisis. It does say there's costs. Um, the costs are about 4% of global GDP and, and by the year 2100, that's 4% less than it otherwise would be. That's not nothing, but it's pretty close to nothing. Um, the uh, recent uh, statement by the New York Federal Reserve stated very clearly after researching this topic extensively that the, the costs of the proposed climate policies are far greater than the costs of climate change itself. So we don't want to debate climate change here, but we do have to get at the actual facts and what the consensus, the scientific consensus dictated by the United Nations actually says, because that informs our thinking moving forward. It informs our solutions. Um, and it actually tells us it's pretty good news. You don't have to sprint to unreliable energy. Um, Let's take a look at Texas. Texas has 30 gigawatts of wind capacity. Um, that's enough to power the whole state. Now, the thing is, when, when the weather gets really bad and it freezes, and by the way, it didn't just freeze in Texas and surrounding states too, they also couldn't get power. So let's just, dis but that's to dispute the notion that if we were just connected to the grid, everything would be fine. It's not necessarily true. But guess what? Wind didn't really work very well. It wasn't windy. Some of the turbines froze. So it was actually producing about 6% um, of, of the, the total generation needed. That meant that coal, gas, uh, nuclear had to, had to provide an outsized amount. Um, the problem was an underinvestment in that baseload energy. Um, we have to accept that fact before we move on. And then we have to accept the next fact. Our goal is to reduce carbon emissions. Uh, not just keep the oil in the ground. It's to reduce the carbon emissions because we agree it does have an effect on the climate in the long term. Uh, so Mr. Mills, let me ask you some, a set of very simple questions and, and please provide simple answers. Does the grid become more stable or less stable when more intermittent power sources are put into it? Less stable, but harder to manage. Certainly harder to manage. Can solar or wind power the grid 100% of the time? There's no scenario where that's reasonably feasible at any price. But they say they can put batteries in place. I mean, how many batteries would you need to do something like that? Can't build enough batteries. You could do other things. There are other forms of storage. They're all expensive. Pumped hydro is the cheapest. Then compressed air. All costs more money than storing oil in the ground, gas in the ground, or piles of coal near a power plant by factors of 10 to 100. Yeah, there's um, some interesting statistics on uh, how much batteries would be would be needed. I think that Tesla's Gigafactory in Nevada can make 35 gigawatts of battery capacity each year. Uh, that would be 46 years of production to make up what Texas would have needed uh, if, if we were on 100% electrical grid. Here's another question. Does our current permitting system even allow a wide scale increase in building out things like transmission lines that would be required for this all solar, all wind kind of scenario? No, it doesn't. We, we, I think we need to fix a lot of things in the regulatory system. And, and NEPA itself is uh, uh, an impediment to an awful lot of infrastructure expansion, as everyone knows. Can you make the materials that go into wind and solar without fossil fuels? No. The world's okay. capacity to make mine minerals is dependent on, on oil, coal, and gas. The path to decarbonizing that sector is even longer than the path to, quote, decarbonizing the grid. And if America ceased all fossil fuel production, where would we get the raw materials and chemicals go, that go into everyday products? I mean, biomedical devices, our computers, our phones, literally everything that we use. Well, you're referring to the use of hydrocarbons or oil for, for petrochemicals. Mm -hmm. So, the, well, you... You, you can, in theory, synthesize them from biofuels. That's possible. Uh, that would require an expansion of 
epic proportions that no one can imagine doing and at great costs, or you don't produce the stuff, you go back using wood, leather, you know, glass instead of plastics. And, and more importantly, if, if, if we don't produce them, somebody's going to produce them. So if countries with poor environmental regulations produce these products, Correct. do global emissions go up or the, do they go down? They go up and they've been going up. In fact, we already know that the IEA has pointed out that the pursuit of greater minerals supplies for green energies is leading to higher energy use per unit of mineral produced and higher emissions. We're just exporting emissions. Well, I'm out of time. We could do this all day. Thank you, Mr. Mills. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I yield back. Uh, Rep. Kasten, you're up next. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm sitting here listening and I got to be honest, I'm just getting sad. We have, we have real problems. The rest of the world is dealing with problems. And we're just having this conversation across party lines about fictions. If, if for the last 30 years, one major political party had been screening from the rooftop that two plus two equals five, two plus two would still equal four. And yet here we are. So, you know, I'm in this lonely position as a devout free market environmentalist. And the reality, which I, I can't believe I even have to say this, is what the private sector does is it finds place to build low cost stuff where they can sell it at a higher price. And it has been a tremendous success since we deregulated our power markets that the private sector did exactly that. They've built all this low cost generation. The days of coal fired power are over because it's an economic dog. We don't have oil fired peakers anymore at any significant degree in the system because they're economic dogs. The simple cycle gas turbines are gone, the steam side gas turbines. That's been wonderful for consumers because it's all been squeezed out by stuff that is both cleaner and cheaper. But it does create real problems. And we should be working on a bipartisan basis to create those real problems because we now are at a point where 40% of the US power grid is being served on a kilowatt hour basis is being served by sources that have effectively no marginal operating cost. About half from renewables, half from nuclear. I'm saying nuclear is no marginal operating cost because the fuel is more like a capital cost there. But it's creating this situation where wholesale markets are basically broke in this country. We've got lots of zero marginal cost generation, 40% of the whole market that is a price taker in a market that was designed to clear, clear where supply and demand balance out. And so now we've got markets that are going into negative prices for long periods. Um, where it's, it's confusing structures. And this is a fixable problem. And it's a wonderful problem. We've caused huge value to flow to consumers, but the value is not flowing to investors. We're seeing in places like Illinois and Ohio, where we've had political scandals because people are trying to say, can we get taxpayers to bail out the nuclear plants because ratepayers just aren't given enough money to pay for them. And so my, my question, and I'll start with you, Ms. Hamilton, but I hope we have time for Ms. Sutley as well. What kind of wholesale market reforms do we need to make sure that in a grid that is increasingly dominated by very low cost, sometimes zero cost generation sources, we still have the incentives in place that are necessary to build the generation and the transmission to bring those to load? Because our problem is not that power prices are too high, it's that they're too low. Thank you so much, Mr. Kasten. And unlike you, I'm happy, not sad, because I see so many solutions out there and I think it's completely doable. So, um, and I'm also very much about markets and about you know free enterprise and making sure that you set up the right signals. So the good news is FERC does have order 2222, which is start be, starting to be implemented right now to try to bring in customer cited resources to actually be compensated for the value that they bring to the grid. I think, as you mentioned, internalizing externalities like greenhouse gas emissions, like resilience, making sure that it's valued and that that value is then passed along in the just and reasonable rates and market products that FERC then oversees. So making sure that we actually set up all of those signals is incredibly important. And FERC is the perfect agency to do that because they build the record. They take evidence that is real and that they get from all kinds of stakeholders and then they sift through the evidence and they make decisions based on what is right for the customer. And I think we're in a really good place right now because I think we have those solutions. I think the private sector wants to come to the table and the private sector wants nothing more than to deploy them and be compensated for what they can build. I'm delighted to hear you say that because, as, as you know, my Energy Price Act would actually direct FERC to do exactly that. Um, exactly. Um, because it, they've, they've got this issue of how are we going to deploy the right generation to get the incentives. Um, Ms. Sutley, any, any comments you want to add to that? 
you know, just a, uh, just a couple of things. First of all, um, because of, uh, you know, because we're a California utility, we actually do have to consider the price of carbon uh, in our dispatch order, as, as well as uh, basically paying for the carbon that is embedded in any of our wholesale transactions. We are not for jurisdictional for wholesale transactions. Um, the, the second thing I mentioned is while we, we're not a member of the California ISO uh, and we're not for jurisdictional, we do participate in a couple of the markets that have been established by the California ISO to address exactly the problem that you um, mentioned. So we are uh, participating in both the energy imbalance market and the, and the, uh, the energy day ahead market. So when that uh, low cost renewable or negative price renewables are available, there is now a market in the West uh, to take advantage of that. And, uh, and we're uh, glad to be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you. I see I'm out of time. I yield back. Thank you, Rep. Kasten. Next, uh, Ranking Member Graves, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Kasten, I think the concern is, is that uh, folks have been out there declaring two plus two equals five, then legislating on the false narrative, which is uh, even more concerning. Um, uh, Mr. Mr. Mills, um, I want to ask you, uh, you, Dan Bruyat, the former energy secretary, made a comment. He said, America's energy and economic security and therefore its national security depends upon this vital flow of uninterrupted power. Modern civilization rests on the foundation that a resilient and secure electrical grid provides. Uh, but you recently wrote in an article, California Governor Gavin Newsom issued emergency orders to procure more natural gas fired electricity capacity to avoid blackouts. And then a possible sign of more such moves to come earlier in the summer, California's electric grid operator stole electricity that Arizona Arizona utilities had purchased that was in transit from Oregon. Can you can you expand on that a little bit and just briefly summarize what happened there? <laughs> and perhaps was, uh, an implication uh, on, on California's reliability. <laughs> thank you, Congressman. And I and I I hope I used air quotes as I say over the word stole because yes, they sir. were they were legally entitled to usurp the power that was in transit from uh, hydro dams north of California to Arizona, which were contracted by the Arizona utility. I think those contracts will be written differently in the future by the by the two counterparties recognizing that those clauses exist. Uh, look, Cal California is an interesting state. Uh, you know, it imports on average over the year thirty percent of its electricity, according to the Cal ISO. So it's very dependent on uh, the grid in the region for the availability of dispatchable power. So the challenge in both transmitting. Uh, power, whether it's from a hydro dam, which can be dispatched, as long as you don't have a drought, uh, you can dispatch power from a hydro dam, from a coal plant, from a gas plant, even from a nuclear plant. You, you can dispatch power from a battery, but to keep lights on, the, the feature of the grid that's really important, and this is what California was dealing with, is they needed power at that particular moment that was coming across their lines, contracted elsewhere, so they took it. Uh, Arizona was able to survive the loss of that power and they were paid for it because they had access to other power, which was dispatchable, which is sort of a key point that I'm making is that I, I happen to agree with uh, Congress and Cass and we have a, we really are in, in desperate need for restructuring how we look at the electric grids because marginal cost power does disrupt things, but recognizing how you price dispatchable power is also critical. We haven't, we haven't done that either. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Chair Sutley, nice to see you again. I worked with you in uh, Louisiana and uh, still running the Mike Boots every once in a while. I hope you're, hope you're doing well. Um, I have a question. I know that the Los Angeles Department of Water and Power owns and, ex and uh, imports its electricity from Intermountain uh, Power Station in Delta, Utah. In, in total, 62% of Los Angeles electricity comes from natural gas, nuclear, and coal. Uh, the coal plant has been LA's single largest power source for about three decades, supplying one-fifth of um, uh, and one-third of the city's electricity, between one-fifth and one-third of the city's supply of electricity. Now, your, your city has set a goal of 100% carbon-free by 2035, but 27% of Los Angeles power currently comes from natural gas. Looking at some of the high cost of electricity in Los Angeles already, what kind of cost are you going to thrust on your payers by, by forcing this conversion by 2035 to 100% carbon free? Um, thank you, uh, Ranking Member Graves, and nice to see you too. Um, well, 
And first of all, I, with respect to the Intermountain uh, Power Plant, uh, it has served Los Angeles well for, for 30 years more, uh, <clears throat> but it is, um, it is going to close in 2025. Um, the original plan was to replace it with a, 800, a smaller a natural gas uh, com combustion uh, combined cycle plant. Uh, and we, are, uh, we have the contracts in place for combustion turbines that will uh, burn up to 30% uh, green hydrogen on the, or hydrogen on the day that they're turned on. So, uh, so we expect Intermountain Power to continue to play an important role just in a, just in a different way. But, but uh, have y'all run price models looking at the, the additional costs that, that your consumers will be impacted by? So as part of the LA100 uh, study, uh, the NREL did look at, at costs and uh, they, this is gonna require a significant investment. They also pointed out that uh, it, was, it was possible and probably advisable to uh, ensure that we are investing in electrification of end uses because that will uh, increase electricity sales and increase the number of, of customers uh, kilowatt hours that those costs are spread over. So uh, that has a double benefit for uh, for our customers in both in terms of reduced air pollution, uh, but also in terms of mitigation of rate impacts. So right now we're going through the financial analysis uh, for uh, our, our rates. Um, we have not had a base rate increase uh, in a number of years, and um, we are, we're looking at that right now. Um, but uh, we continue to meet all our financial metrics and are looking at ways to ensure that, that we can do this transition in an affordable way. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Madam Chair, if, if you don't mind, I, I just I want to clarify something earlier. I, I heard you all raise concerns about um, comments made by Ms. Miller, and I did want to just be very clear for the record. She did not say that anyone was anti-American. We went back and listened. She clearly stated that, that it, she was advocating for policies that were anti-American energy policy. So um, in, in other words, anti-domestic energy production. And I wanted to be clear- Hey, we're all about was, domestic energy in this hearing today, so- Okay, I just um, wanted to be clear that nobody was called anti-American uh, and, and, and that it, she did clearly say anti-American energy. So I just wanted to clarify that to make sure that there was no ill will among committee members. All right, thank you, Ranking thank you. Member Graves. Um, and next we'll go to, to Rep Naguz, and I have to say, um, Rev Naguz, we're, we're still thinking about all of your uh, neighbors that the, the wildfires that swept through the Boulder area are still very fresh in everyone's minds. And um, you're, you're recognized for five minutes. Well, uh, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, first for holding this important and timely hearing on ensuring the reliability and the resiliency of our electric grid, and also for your very kind words. And of course, uh, the words that I've, I've heard from uh, colleagues on both sides of the aisle over the course of the last few months as we've dealt with a very difficult uh, series of fires here in our community. I certainly appreciate it, as does my community. Uh, and as you noted, uh, Chairwoman Castor, uh, my district in Colorado has experienced some of the most devastating wildfires in the history of our state all over the course of the last 15 months, uh, from the Cameron Peak and East Troublesome fires in 2020, uh, that were the first and second largest fires in state history, to the most recent Marshall Fire that destroyed more than 1,000 homes and became the most destructive fire in our state's history. Uh, many of you traveled to Colorado for the field hearing that we held in Boulder uh, over two years ago, pre-pandemic, and uh, during that, uh, that hearing had an opportunity to visit these same communities that have now been besieged by wildfires. Uh, so many communities, so many homes rather, destroyed uh, in the blaze uh, that occurred on December 30th, which is far later uh, than what would be typically considered fire season. And as we've frequently discussed in this committee, climate change is only increasing the severity and the frequency of extreme weather events and natural disasters like wildfires. Uh, and as I said, has caused I think all of us collectively to reconsider what we previously considered to be fire season. It clearly now uh, goes all year long here in Colorado and across the Rocky Mountain West. And we have to ensure that our infrastructure is prepared for these events, which is uh, why uh, today's hearing is certainly so critical for me. Uh, it's also why 
Uh, we introduced with Senator Wyden last year, the Disaster Safe Power Grid Act. We was glad to see some of the investments that we called for in that bill included in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act or the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law uh, to ensure electric grid infrastructure is prepared to withstand future disasters and wildfires. And uh, appreciate the conversation about the particular benefits of that bill uh, that uh, Chair Castor uh, noted and articulated earlier uh, during the course of today's hearing. Uh, I wanna talk about a particular issue that is certainly percolating here in our community uh, as a byproduct of the Marshall Fire and the rebuilding process that we are now deeply engaged in. Uh, it is important that we support efforts to build back better in the wake of disasters like those that my district experienced and we're working hard on those efforts right now, particularly in the wake of the Marshall Fire. Ms. Hamilton, uh, you've, you've talked a bit about this during the course of the hearing, but also in your written testimony about the importance of directly investing in physical structures, such as homes and buildings to reduce the risk of damage during a natural disaster. I wonder if you might be able to expound a bit on whether you think the federal government should provide incentives for homeowners to rebuild zero or lower emission homes uh, with uh, electric appliances and equipment after disasters and, and how you believe that might uh, help fight the climate crisis. Yeah, absolutely. That is such a great question because often everything stems from the home and, you know, what do we need to make those resilient? So making sure that the insulation is strong, that the roofing is strong. In fact, there's an organization in Florida called the Solar Energy Loan Fund that has found that if they harden the roof, it reduces, her, this isn't the case of hurricane, but it could certainly happen with any natural disaster. They harden the roof, they're able to put solar on, reduce insurance costs that then pay for the solar. This can happen in communities all over in very different ways. In Louisiana, the company Posigen does first energy audits and then installs solar so that immediately you can start seeing the benefits of reduced energy costs while making sure that you have that power. If you install solar and you have a backup battery, you'll have the power there in case of any kind of fire. But even more importantly, um, Mr. Nagus, is we need to plan, we need visibility, we need technologies that allow us to understand when something is gonna happen, whether that's on the transmission side or the distribution side, and be able to react in a resilient way and plan for these instances. So maybe not everybody is gonna be able to withstand an instance like this, but maybe you can have community centers, microgrids that allow communities to continue running really critical facilities for neighborhoods so that there is some place to go in case of an event like this. Well, I, your insights are uh, certainly very helpful and uh, our office is very interested in pursuing this further and potentially uh, introducing legislation on the same in terms of federal rebates that might be brought to bear for consumers. Uh, and I see that I'm running out of time, uh, Dr. Wayland. I would just say I very much appreciated your testimony, in particular, the smart technologies that you described that can predict problems on transmission lines before they can start wildfires. We recently had a wildfire in the northern part of my district, uh, far smaller, but in Estes Park, uh, that was caused in part by a down power line. And it's clear that those smart technologies are crucial uh, for my communities, for communities across the state of Colorado, and indeed across the Rocky Mountain West, as wildfires become more pervasive. Uh, here. So look forward to continuing to work on that issue as well. And with that, I yield uh, back the balance of my time, Madam Chair. Thank you, Rep. Magoose. And thanks to all of our witnesses for your outstanding testimony today. Uh, I'm going to go to the ranking member if he wants to make a unanimous consent request. Mr. Gray, Rep. Graves, you have any documents? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, I have uh, two documents. Uh, number one is a uh, EIA report uh, titled uh, oil, oil Fired Generators Helped Meet Electric Demand in New England This January. And the second one is uh, Big But Affordable Effort Needed for America to Reach Net Zero Emissions by 2050, which is a Princeton study. Um, and uh, just talking about two of the issues that I cited earlier. So I'm asking unanimous consent that those be included in the record. All right, without objection. And without objection, I'd like to enter into the record a February 2022 report from Grid Strategies titled The One Year Anniversary of Winter Storm Uri Lessons Learned and the Continued Need for Large Scale Transmission, uh, to a July 2021 report from the American Council on Renewable Energy 
and the macro grid initiative titled Transmission Makes the Power System Resilient to Extreme Weather. And three, a February 2022 report from Environment American, America titled Rooftop Solar and the 2021 Texas Power Crisis, Exploring Small Scale Solar's Potential to Improve Grid Resilience During a Deep Freeze Event. You know, this was a very important hearing, and I think we, we again have to let the American people know that we hear you. We, we're overwhelmed watching these climate fueled disasters, whether it's the, the deadly winter storm in Texas or floods in the Midwest like Tennessee, or I see Rep Bonamici, the, the deadly heat wave in the Pacific Northwest, the wildfires uh, everywhere. And we're doing something about it. Thankfully, this bipartisan infrastructure law gives us new resources to work with the Biden administration to make our grid more reliable and resilient. And if we can now work to get the expand clean energy and reduce pollution, create jobs um, and lower costs for consumers, that's that's what we aim to do here. So thank you all for pr participating in this hearing and uh, the committee hearing is adjourned. Thank you.